Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to yet another GCSE revision live. So this live is for revision, hardcore revision gang, right? So today is bank holiday. I know some people have decided, oh, do you know what? I know that it's exams like in two and a half weeks time, but I'm just taking this time off, right? In fact, actually, I know that um history. So next week, uh, history, or is it this week, actually, guys? I know that there's history exams this week at some stage. And French exams or like spoken languages exams, right? So I know that there's some people who are like, Do you know what, even if exams are starting, I'm just going to take today off, right? Because, you know, it's bank holiday, going to take the day off. But of course, this live is not for you if you want to be taking time off, especially during GCSE season. This is for hardcore revision gang who want to be going for gold. You want to be seeing some really, really good results when August time rolls around. Okay. And of course, even when the exams roll around for English language and English literature, you want to be really starting off strong. Okay. So of course, this live is especially for those of you that want to stay in top form. So today, I'm going to be looking at English language. The last two weeks I was looking at literature, okay? So I was looking at literature paper one, paper two. The reason being is because obviously this is going to be your first set of exams on the 17th of May. So this is in about two and a half weeks. You've got your first literature paper one. Then of course on 24th of May, you've got literature paper two. But then after that, at the beginning of June, you've got this exam to consider. So, of course, you, this is now a really delicate balancing act for those of you in year 11. You're really trying to keep on top of all of this language stuff, plus also all your other topics. So, I'm not going to waffle too much, guys. Today, I did not come to waffle. I came to get straight into it. So, let's do this, okay? So, GCSE Bank Holiday Revision Gang, let's do this. Now, today we're going to be looking at the language paper one exam and more specifically the exam that came up in this particular paper. This is the November 2019 paper. By the way, guys, I'm sure you have already noticed if you've been in enough of my lives that there's a November language paper and a June language paper. The reason why there's a November language paper, because this is for the people that need to do resets, right? So um, if people don't get, you know, um, a pass or the, you know, a decent enough grade, for example, for sixth form and so on, usually people tend to opt for resets in November just to kind of get out of the way and not do resets at the same time as the time they're doing the A-levels. That's why you've got a November paper. This is the reset paper for this particular year, right? So I'm going to be looking at that reset paper because I think I've not looked at this. I've looked at a more recent language paper ones and what I'm doing with all of these lives is I'm trying my best to get through as many of these past paper questions as possible so that you guys can be covered, right? So today I'm going to be looking at this. By the way, remember, you can download all of these past exam papers directly from AQA's website. Now, let's begin by considering the language paper one exam. What's the end goal, guys? When it comes to this particular paper, remember that this paper firstly tests your comprehension skills. Are you able to read the extract? Select the relevant information and answer the questions correctly, concisely, but also using the subject terminology, uh, language and literature terminology, okay? Also, the skills that are tested are your creative and descriptive writing skills, okay? Of course, when it comes to creative writing, your start, you can start at one point using the Story Mountain, start from your beginning where you introduce the setting and weather. Build up is where you've got, you know, your character going on an adventure. Problem is the obstacle they face. Resolution is how they resolve that issue. Ending is, you know, how are they different in, in one way or another by the end of your story. That's your creative writing story. Descriptive writing is usually you get an image. You've got to describe that image. And usually, as opposed to the story mountain structure, I always suggest kind of keeping the image and the descriptive writing to a very static description, right? So the restrictive part of descriptive writing is you can't really go too far out of that image, right? You've got to really, really stick to the image. And so I always suggest when you're looking at the image, look at what's going on, on the outside, take one step in, look more closely at what's going on in the inside. Kind of your descriptive writing is you're really drilling down really specific elements of the image, hence the concentric circle. So you start off with your atmosphere and mood, uh, or rather your setting and weather paragraph for descriptive writing, then your atmosphere and mood, then your central focus, the most obvious thing, then describing the feelings either of the image or, um, you know, of objects within the image before you finish off with an ever so slight change in your descriptive writing. So remember for language paper one, 
It tests your comprehension skills for section A and your creative and descri descriptive writing skills for question B. And guys, I'm going to be doing a GCSE revision special this Wednesday from 6 p.m. specifically focused on creative and descriptive writing okay this part of the paper is really really important it holds half of the overall marks available for your language paper one exam so of course it kind of deserves its own special life i haven't done enough of these so i'm going to do that this wednesday however today obviously i want to be looking at this paper specifically now when it comes to um this particular exam remember for those of you in year 11, you now need to be completely clear on timings, okay? If you're currently in year 10, year 9, obviously you can roughly know these timings. If you're in year 10, to be honest, you obviously need to know these timings for end of year exams, right? But if you're in year 9, year 10, you can kind of know these timings, but it's not a massive deal. If you're currently in year 11, you really need to know this stuff, right? So let's talk about timings for this paper before we dive into it. So you've got 1 hour 45 minutes. How should you allocate that time? I would suggest spend the first 10 minutes of the exam reading the questions highlighting keywords in the question and then the insert then question number one this is four statements um you know you're given usually you ask to look at the first paragraph four statements that are true it's worth four marks spend five minutes on this question question two your first language question how does the writer use language to describe blah 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 blah, blah. it's worth eight marks spend 10 minutes on this question Question three, this is the structure question. Worth eight marks, spend 10 minutes on this question. Question number four, this is where you get the student statement. A student having read this said, blah, 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 blah. It's worth 20 marks to spend 20 minutes on this question. Then question number five, which is the creative or descriptive writing question. You make a choice between either you're going to go for creative writing or descriptive writing as it's worth half of the overall paper's marks. I would suggest spend 50 minutes on this question. 10 minutes planning. And around 40 minutes writing your response. Now, I personally, so um, for those of you that obviously follow this TikTok page, I have a very exciting collab coming up with Mr. Sales. And if you've seen the language paper one advice that he has, his suggestion, obviously, guys, we have different teaching styles. He suggests start with question number five, work backwards, then question four, three, two, one. I personally feel if you're quite strict and good with your timings, you can go literally with question one, two, three, four and five. And guys, by the way, we literally have a collab that's going to be coming out this Sunday where we're going to do our predictions for Macbeth, Christmas Carol for um, language, literature paper one and also literature paper two um, predictions. OK, and then we're also going to have um, another collab at some stage later on this month on language paper one. OK, however, essentially some teachers will say just like Mr. Sally's start backwards, work backwards if you're brave enough to do it. I personally feel that sometimes, especially because this um, exam is going to be first thing in the morning, right? Um, if you're starting off a bit cold, it can be quite intense to just dive straight into creative and descriptive writing. What I tend to tell my students is, look, if you're really bad with your timings, work backwards. However, if you're okay with your timings and you're quite disciplined, just work through it chronologically, but make sure you keep a really strict eye on time, okay? So obviously, guys, depends on which approach you prefer. As I mentioned, the Mr. Sally's video that I literally released on TikTok yesterday, he basically suggests work backwards, up to you, okay? So that's that for timings and comprehension slash creative and descriptive writing as i mentioned guys this exam paper that i'm going to be going through today you can download it for free on aqa's website it's the reset paper for the november 2019 exam because i haven't gone through this paper specifically okay so with that being said i'm going to begin with my highlighter handy of course make sure you always have your highlighter ready in your exams have lots of different pens if those of you guys um some of you might have been on enough of my lives to see me like running out of ink right so then i have my backup pens guys make sure in your exams you always go with lots of different backup pens in case you run out okay you don't want to be wasting time holding your hand up asking the invigilator please 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 hurry up come 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 i need an extra pen please give me a pen okay that is your responsibility to try and make sure you arrange that okay i've literally seen and i've always been really shocked guys when i see guys and students walking into the exam hall literally holding a single individual pen okay that tells me that they're not taking the exam seriously enough don't go with just one individual pen go with lots of different ones in case ink runs out anyway enough of waffling let's read through the question paper first 
and then the insert after we get a lay of the land as i mentioned today guys we're going to be looking at section eight and on wednesday i'm going to be doing a creative and descriptive writing special looking at how to answer and how to write a model response when it comes to creative and descriptive writing. But let's have a look at this entire paper, okay? Question number one, read again the first part of the source from lines one to five. We know that we're always going to be asked to look at the first paragraph in paper one. Lines one to five, list four things about Zoe's surroundings from this part of the source, okay? So I've got to find four things about somebody called Zoe. That's question number one. Question number two, you should always anticipate this is a language question and you're always given a bit of the extract, meaning you don't have to go back to the insert to read it over again. Look in detail at this extract from lines 9 to 14 of this source. Okay, I'm not going to read this because I have no context. How does the writer use language to describe Zoe's feelings? Okay, so this is Zoe who's been asked in question number one. I'm being asked to also talk about her in question number two. And I'm asked to focus on language so you can include the writer's choice of words and phrases, language features and techniques, sentence forms. As I keep on mentioning, guys, in my previous lives... This bullet point is a little bit confusing. Not sure why AQA likes including sentence forms because strictly sentences are structure, not language. How do you reconcile this? How do you make sure that you also answer all of these bullet points plus also answer the question? Make one of your paragraphs related to how an author uses a declarative sentence to convey a simile, a metaphor, whatever, okay? That's for question number two. Let's have a look at what came up for question number three. We know from past experience that the structure is always exactly the same. Question three is going to be the structure question. So let's have a look. You're asked to look at the whole of the source, everything. This text is from the beginning of a novel. If it's from the start of the novel, remember that authors always want to use the first chapter to hook you in, okay? Meaning that it's probably going to be a little bit dramatic. How's the writer structure the text to interest you as a reader? Remember, structure is stuff like repetition listing, um, things like sentence type. Structure is also beginning versus middle versus end. Structure relates to things like, you know, a circular storyline. OK, so if it begins in the same way as the way it ends, that's structure. If also the author zooms in on one particular thing, right? So it starts off with maybe zoomed in on one particular object. So, for instance, um, I think this is maybe three weeks back. I'd looked at the 2022 paper with the scorpion. And um, it zoomed in on the scorpion, right? It was hanging over the baby, blah, blah, blah. That's a structure point. Anyway, so how's the writer structure the text to interest you? As a reader, you're always interested. Guys, it's not about saying, oh, um, you know, actually, to be honest, Mr. Examiner, Mrs. Examiner, I was actually bored to tears. This extract was like really boring because, you know, I'd rather play whatever games that people play. I don't know. Is Fortnite still a thing or is, has, has that moved on? Is it like Harry Potter or whatever? Anyway, it's not about whether you're genuinely interested you are always interested. The examiner does not actually care about your opinion. You, the writer always successfully interests you as a reader. Write about what the writer focuses your attention on at the beginning of the source. You must always mention beginning because this is mentioned in this bullet point. How and why the writer changes this focus as the source develops and then any other structural features that interest you. Guys, I would always suggest making two peel paragraphs. To be honest, also this goes for question number two. Two peel paragraphs um, on language, two peel paragraphs on structure. I would suggest your first peel, you combine beginning and juxtapose that either with middle or end. A good juxtaposition, right? Juxtaposing means you contrast. You take something from the start of the extract, something from the end. And then you say, even if it's the same, then that means it's circular. If it's different, then, you know, is there a shift in focus? Combine those into a peel paragraph. It, it's going to mean that obviously your paragraph is a little bit long, but this is a really powerful way of gaining some really, really good marks in question number three. Then have an additional peel paragraph focusing on another structural element. Is it zooming in? Is it repetition? Is there, for example, stuff like anaphora? Anaphora means when there's constant repetitive reference to the subject of a story. Um, you know, for example, I'm going to go back to the 2022 paper that I looked at about three or four weeks back. The scorpion, the scorpion, the scorpion, the scorpion. There's always constant focus on the scorpion in the first part of the extract all the way to the middle. That's anaphora, the repetitive reference to the subject of a story. This is a grade nine technique and it's structural. That's question number three. Let's have a look at question number four. We always know that question before we're going to get a statement. Again, guys, if you've seen the Mr. Sally's um, post I put up, he said examiners will always give you a statement that they don't actually care about. It's up to you to agree. From his perspective, you agree to an extent, but then just add one line, maybe saying mm, you can maybe disagree. Right. Again, for me personally, I just think agree. Find four points. 
why you would agree, okay? Because the statement never tends to contradict what's happening. However, what I can do in the spirit of, you know, um, in, in being a nice collaborative spirit with Mr. Sally's is I might show you guys maybe one paragraph where you can maybe po possibly disagree. But to be honest, in my opinion, I think you can literally just say, yep, I agree with the student statement because it doesn't tend to contradict what's happening in the extract. So you're asked to focus as part of your answer and the second source of the, um, from line 28 to the end. Sorry, guys, if I'm moving too quickly, I've literally just drank um, tea, a quick coffee, but I drank tea. So maybe that might be speeding up the pace of my Speaking, I'll try and slow it down. A student said, in this part of the story with Zoe, Zoe is mentioned again. She's mentioned in question one. So, uh, yep, yeah, question one, Zoe's surroundings. Question two, and now she's being mentioned in question number four. Already, even before reading the extract, I know that this person plays a really central role. In this part of the story with Zoe and Jake, okay, so there's someone else that's mentioned, a court in the avalanche. Interesting. I can't believe Zoe is so slow to react to the warning signs because in the end, the situation sounds really dangerous. Okay, interesting. This is a student statement. This is a statement that examiners give you. They actually don't genuinely care about it. You disagree. Maybe you can add an extra sentence saying why you may disagree if you want to make it a debate. I personally don't think that this question is a debate. You just literally use a mix of language and structure to basically say to what extent you agree with the student statement because the student statement doesn't tend to contradict what's happening in the extract. In your response, you could consider Zoe's reactions in this part of the story. So this is line 28 to the end. Evaluate how the writer makes the situation sound dangerous. Support your response with references to the text. People always get unnecessarily confused with this idea of evaluation. They're like, miss, what does evaluation mean? Oh my gosh, do you know what? I totally understood this question until I saw evaluate. Evaluate is really simple, guys. It just means you are saying... The writer uses whatever language technique or whatever structure technique to convey what the student statement is saying. So in this case, it's to convey how Zoe is slow to react to warning signs because in the end, the situation sounds dangerous. Evaluation is literally saying, oh, the writer uses alliteration in this case to show that Zoe is slow. Or, um, cool, so the writer uses a, a declarative sentence structure to show that, you know, Zoe is slow to react to warning signs. That's literally what evaluation means. It's not any more complicated than that, okay? Now we've got a lay of the land. We know what the extract, uh, or rather what the questions want us to focus in on when reading the extract. So now let's have a look at the extract. Again, as I mentioned, guys, I have um, put up, uh, I guess, like a post on English Language Paper 1, Mr. Saleh's um, advice. He says, start with question number five. I personally say, if you can, if you're super disciplined with your um, timekeeping, work through it chronologically. Start with reading this extract, question one, two, three, four, and then five, okay? I think sometimes when you're kind of starting cold with uh, English language, diving straight into creative writing, I think can be a little bit intense because also, guys, remember all your language and literature exams for English are first thing in the morning. I can't imagine anything worse than diving into writing a creative story from the jump, but if you can do it, fair enough, by all means, go ahead and do it, okay? And obviously do do that if you're really bad with your timekeeping, okay? Anyway, we've got an lay of the land, we know what we're supposed to be looking for, let's have a look at the source. So source A, we always get just one source. This extract is from the beginning of a novel by Graham Joyce. We know that it's from the start, meaning it's supposed to capture us and captivate us. A young married couple, Zoe and Jake, are on a skiing holiday in the French Pyrene Pyrenees, Pyrenean Mountains. Sorry, guys. Um, some people are also giving me like massive grief on my pronunciation of some of these words. Um, there was like some T-Rex extract and it was like tedactorals or something like that. And people are like, oh, you can't see the, the dinosaurs like this. So I'm pretty sure someone's going to give me grief about how I've pronounced this. Anyway, so Zoe and Jake are on a skiing holiday in the Pyrenean mountains. It was snowing again. Interesting opening. Simple sentence. Remember, guys, simple sentence, subject, verb, object. Usually, a short, simple sentence speeds up the pace of the writing. What that does is it increases our interest in the extract. By the way, guys, also don't always say that everything increases tension, okay? This, in this case, it just increases our interest, okay? So it was snowing again. This simple sentence is really interesting. Gentle six pointed flakes from a picture book was settling on her jacket sleeve. So it's saying that these snowflakes from a picture book, this is a metaphor describing something as something else. This is language. 
Again, you're thinking of all of this as you're going through the extract. The mountain air prickled with ice and the smell of pine resin. Several hundred meters below lay the dark outline of San Bernard and Ort. Okay, so I'm guessing this is a mountain. The Pyrenean Resort Village. Across the west, the irregular peaks of the mountain range. Okay, so here we've got a really scenic and picturesque description. By the way, guys, when I say stuff like scenic and picturesque, I am using ambitious vocabulary. Guys, make sure you are also paying attention to your AO5 and your AO6, okay? Ambitious language and vocabulary also is now what's going to be getting you the higher band marks, okay? We're trying to aim for grade 8s and grade 9s. And part of that is you, rather than saying, oh, this is such a nice description. It's scenic and picturesque. Zoe pulled the air into her lungs. Okay, so now we've got Zoe being mentioned here. Pulled the air into her lungs, feeling the cracking... Uh, cracking cold of it before letting go so she's inhaling and when the mountain seemed to nod so the mountain personification here it nods and sighs back at her she almost thought she could die in that place and happily so here there's really lots of language techniques we've got personification we've also got hyperbole by the way guys if you're in your um in year 11 and any of these words that i'm using sound unfamiliar that should be setting off alarm bells in your head. What you should do if you're not entirely clear about this stuff, watch the video that I created five minutes long on language and structure. I literally show all the language techniques, their meanings, structure techniques, their meanings, YouTube. Because you should, by this stage, if you're having your exams starting, English exams starting in two and a half weeks time, this stuff, you should know what this is. Otherwise, it should be ringing alarm bells in your head. If there are a few moments in life that come as clear and as pure as ice, interesting simile. When the mountain breathed back at her, Zoe knew she had trapped one such moment and it could never be taken away. So she's so like, wow, this place is amazing. It's gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Everywhere was snow and silence. So we've got sibilance here. So we've got lots. So the writer is really, remember guys, this is at the beginning of the extract. So the writer, you know, this is the time where we could snap the book shut and then throw it away. So the writer is really, really working hard with all of this language and structure techniques to really reel us in and make us intrigued as readers. So they're using this simile and of course the sibilance to convey this beautiful yet cold landscape. Snow and silence, snow and silence, the complete arrest of life, a rehearsal and a pre-echo of death. Interesting. And there's this echo onomatopoeia, sound words. She pointed her skates down the hill. They looked like weird talons of brilliant red and gold in the powder snow. And she waited, ready to swoop. So this is her skis and they look like talons. Okay, so this is another simile. I am alive. I am an eagle. So now here we've got italics showing what Zoe is thinking as she's like, you know, skiing down. The sun was up now. In a few minutes, there would be more skiers to break the eerie morning spell. So it's an enchanting description. Magical. But right now, they had the snow in the morning entirely to themselves. Okay, she hasn't started skiing, but she's literally about, she's on the cusp, she's on the edge of skiing. There was a whisper behind her. Onomatopoeia, more onomatopoeia. So... You've got echo here. You've got whisper. Make sure you spell onomatopoeia, put a e r correctly. It was the effortless track of Jake's ski. So this is the Jake that's mentioned in question number four. As he came over the edge, over the ridge and caught up with her. This is perfection. Dialogue. You ready to go? She asked. Yep, let's do it. So we've got lots of dialogue back and forth here between them. And they're like, wow, so excited. Oh my gosh, we're going to start skiing. They'd got up early. It was really early in the morning to beat the holiday making hordes for this first run of the morning. Because this, the tranquility, the silence, the undisturbed snow and the feeling of proximity. So you've got tranquility, you've got silence, you've got undisturbed snow, you've got the proximity to an eagle's flight was what it was all about. Lots of listing. Jake hit the west side of the steep but broad slope and she took the east. So Jake went west, she went east. Uh, carving matching parallel tracks through the fresh snow so they're the only ones it's totally silent apart from them but at the edge of the slope near the curtain of trees metaphor 
she felt a small slab of snow slip from beneath underneath her so we've got lots of sibilance here there's a little slab that goes beneath her okay so now here there's a slow build up interesting it was like she'd been bucked so she took the fall line to recover her balance so she's kind of tricked she's like oh what's going on there before she dropped 300 meters the whisper again this whisper there's this whisper that's been mentioned here and then this whisper is mentioned here again the whisper of a, sp a skis was displaced by a rumble so now it goes from a whisper to a rumble on a map here Zoe saw the periphery, the side, the sideline of her vision that Jake had come to a halt. So Jake had stopped at the side of the pist and was looking back up at the slope. Irritated by the full start they'd made, she etched a few turns before skidding to a halt. So she stops, turning to look back at her. Let's see, page two. Oh, this is all so tantalizing. Turning to look back at her husband. Okay, so, uh, so Jake is her husband. The rumble, so now this rumble has become louder. And this is a simple sentence, by the way, so now here's tension. There was a pillar of what looked like grey smoke unfurling in silky banners at the head of the slope, top of the mountain, mountain, like the heraldry of armies. So now here, it's almost like um, nature is, is calling up its um, weapons, its troops. Kind of like, um, if those of you are studying, if some of you are studying power and conflict, you've got Wilfred Owen, um, the melancholy, um, or the me melancholy army, okay? So you've got kind of similar wording here. It was beautiful. It made her smart. So this is interesting because here we've got kind of scary imagery that's being used in the simile, yet actually it's making Zoe smile. That's weird. Then her smile iced over. Another simple sentence. Jake was speeding straight towards her. So Jake is panicking, speeding. His face was rubberized. He mouthed something as he flew at her. Get to the side, to the side. Dialogue. She knew now that it was an avalanche. Jake slowed, batting at her with his ski pole. Get into the trees. Hang on to a tree. So he's screaming at her at this stage. So Zoe is definitely quite slow to realize this. Okay, it's Jake that's using this dialogue and he's screaming at her. This is also what we call exclamatory sentences because it ends with an exclamation mark. He's shouting. He's scared. He's panicked. Zoe took way too long to figure out this situation. The rumbling had become a roaring in her ears. So it goes from a whisper to a rumble. And now it's become a roaring. So this is a really dramatic shift. Drowning Jake's words. She pushed herself down the fall line, scrambling for traction. So here she's trying to run away, trying to accelerate away from the roaring cloud breaking behind her like a tsunami at sea. So here, now this simile is really, really threatening. Jagged black cracks appeared in the snow in front of her. Now the ground is opening up. She angled her skis towards the side of the slope, hang heading for the trees, but it was too late. She saw Jake's black suit go bundling past her as he was turned by the great mass of snake and snow. So he's been caught in this avalanche. Then she too was punched off her feet and carried through the air, twisting, spinning, turning in the white out. Rule of three. She remembered something about spreading her arms around her head. For a few moments, it was like being agitated inside a washing machine. Turned over head, uh, turned head over heels a few times until at last she, she was dumped heavily in a rib cracking fall. So the avalanche lifts her up, almost punches her and then starts throwing her around. And when it slams her into the ground, her ribs start cracking. So this is a really dangerous avalanche. Remember that they are the only ones because it's so early in the morning. So also there's a lot of tension because we're like, oh my gosh, they're totally alone. Are they going to be rescued? Then there came a chattering noise, like the amplified jaws of a million termites chewing on wood. The noise itself filled her ears and muffled everything and then there was silence the total whiteness faded to gray and then to black so she now faints and this silence so at first the silence the meaning the connotations connotations means um the meaning built around a word okay so the associations we have around a word we say connotations grade nine technique okay connotations means the meaning the indirect meaning built around a word connotations of silence here at first is oh it's nice and peaceful it suddenly shifts to ominous the silence here now is really scary ominous and dangerous 
okay remember guys for example another example for those of you that don't quite get what connotations means connotations could be for example a color right so here i've got a red pen it's a red pen but it just has black um, ink okay connotations are the direct meaning of red the color red is just a color right red the meaning built around red i.e the connotations is danger blood murder that's what connotations means for those of you that don't totally understand it okay anyway so this is a really interesting extract basically describing um you know this skiing um holiday starts off really nice really peaceful um zoe and jake are having you know a great time just looking out on this quiet snowy um terrain this quiet snowy landscape but then suddenly there's a shift right so this silence is disturbed it starts off by a little whisper then it becomes a rumble then it becomes a roaring, right? And then there's an avalanche, right? So uh, where's the roaring? There's a roaring somewhere here. Here we go. It becomes a massive roaring. And so this rumble becomes um, louder, becomes a roaring. Her husband, Jake, figures this out quickly, tries to warn her, and then he gets caught up in the snow. We don't know whether he's died. But also Zoe, towards the end, she gets caught up and then faints, okay? Because the whiteness faded to grey. So her vision, she's looking around, it goes grey. And then black, right? So she passes out. So with that being said, I've read the extract. I know what the questions, especially in section A, want me to answer. So now with that in mind, I'm literally going to begin by looking at question number one. For me personally, if I was sitting this exam, I'd just be really, really clear on timings. And I'd know that I only need to spend a max of five minutes on this question. I don't need to quote. I just need to make sure that I try and spend five minutes or less answering this question. Guys, the only way you can go wrong with this four marker is writing one word sentences. Just write four sentences, but you don't need to quote, okay? So you ask the cut lines one to five from the extracts, this part of the extract here. First paragraph. Four things about Zoe's surroundings from this part of the source. This, the first thing is it's snowing. The second thing is it smells of pine resin. The third thing is there is um, uh, several meters. So below her, there's this uh, mountain, I guess, Saint Bernard on, on Hort, right? That's the next thing. And then the final thing is, um, oh yeah, there's even um, six pointed flakes. Okay, so it's snowing. The snow has six pointed flakes. It smells of pine resin. There's Saint Bernard on Hort be um, below her. That's it. So it's actually this simple. It was snowing. It smelled of pine resin. Mm, she, uh, there was Saint Bernard on Ort below her. Mm, the, or even uh, the snow had six pointed flakes that's it it was snowing it smelled of pine resin there was some bernard and all be below her the snow had six pointed flakes that's it for question number one if you can try and do it in a minute, a minute then you can allocate the additional three four minutes to other questions that deserve a bit more time okay so if you can take this five minute down to maybe like 60 seconds one and two minutes at most then maybe you can allocate a little bit more time to question four okay now, looking at question two, so now this is the first um, essay question, right? So question number one is a gift. Really straightforward. Just make sure you don't fluff it up by either using wrong lines or evidence from the wrong lines or um, writing in one word sentences because this is an English exam after all. Question number two, we've got the extract right there in front of us. You're asked to talk about language. As I mentioned, language relates to things like the building blocks of English. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns. You can use that to zoom in. Language also relates to literature techniques, alliteration, metaphor, similes, um, onomatopoeia. All of that is language. Sentences are not language. Sentences are structure. However, because AQA says you have to mention sentence forms, couple, combine one of your observations with, um, you know, the fact that, for example, a simile is used in a declarative sentence okay so we've got this extract where we've got zoe that's looking around if there are a few moments in life that come as clear and pure as ice when the mountain breathed back at her zoe knew she trapped one such moment and it could never be taken away i would probably select something from the beginning here which is um this simile but also the mountain breathing back at her right so you've got the simile coupled with 
Personification. In this declarative sentence, what does this indicate when it comes to Zoe's feelings? She feels incredibly peaceful. She feels at one with nature. Wow, nature is giving her clarity. What does clarity mean? Clarity means it's making her clear headed. She's looking at around and she's like, oh my God, this snow, it's just making me like, it's just, it's just paradise. I can think clearly now, okay? Because I've selected something from the first sentence, I'm literally going to even ignore the middle part. I will look at the final line. The reason why it's good to select something from the beginning, possibly middle if you have to, but then definitely something from the end is because you're showing a range of examples. Guys, try not to recycle the same points, but also if you have selected something from the first sentence, don't select something from the second sentence. It just comes off as a little bit lazy, okay? You are trying to rack up points, okay? So maybe something more towards hair. So this is her skis, which looked like weird tan talons of brilliant red and gold. And she um, waited, ready to swoop. She says, I'm an eagle, which is a metaphor. And what this is showing in terms of her feelings is she feels really elated. She's excited. She feels really adventurous, okay? She feels almost like she's on top of the world. I've got the two bits of evidence I'm going to use, right? So clear and pure as ice as well as mountain breathing back at her. That'll be my first point. I'm an equal second point. This actually ties to how many points to write for this eight marker. My suggestion, guys, is adopt in terms of paragraph structure and paragraph framework, the peel paragraph format. In fact, I should have probably mentioned that at the beginning. Peel paragraphs. I know that there's lots of variations. You've got petal, you've got Peter paragraphs, etc. I really like peel paragraphs because they are quite simple in structure. But just because it's simple doesn't mean you make basic points. Yeah. So point means it's so a peel. The first P means point. You're using keywords from the question. The first E means evidence you're quoting. Explanation, which is where the bulk of your marks are. This is where you add technique and analysis. You're basically saying, okay, so I think what this is illustrating to me about Zoe's feelings is she's elated, whatever. Then link is you're linking it back to the question, reminding the, re the examiner. I'm using keywords from the question. I understand the assignment. Now here, I would suggest for this eight marker, try to aim to write two pill paragraphs. Selecting um, first bit of a quotation for your first pill paragraph, taking one word, zooming in, doing your word level analysis, then doing that times two with the second uh, sentence, right? The second phrase. So... I've selected my two bits of evidence. I know I need to t talk about how the writer's using language to describe Zoe's feelings, and I need to ensure that at least one of my peel paragraphs mentions sentence forms. So this is how I would begin my first peel paragraph. As I mentioned, guys, you're going to see that when I make my point, my evidence, my explanation, and my link point, I am going to layer in complexity okay peel four steps but it's not four lines yeah when you're writing your peel paragraph it's not one line for each you are still layering in points so firstly i'm making the opening point saying how are zoe's feelings described it is evident that zoe feels a deep sense of contentment when she is on the mountain. Again, using ambitious language. Contentment means happiness. Indeed, still on my opening point. Being on the mountain and inhaling its atmosphere gives her a sense of clarity she's clear-headed this is my opening point as you can see it's a point i've used um i've linked it to the question but I've just not made it one sentence. I've made it two sentences. I'm layering in complexity into my argument. Firstly, it's evident that Zoe feels a deep sense of contentment, happiness, when she is on the mountain. Indeed, which means, in fact, being on the mountain and inhaling its atmosphere gives her a sense of clarity. Now I need to embed my evidence. Um, the area, or even um, the area seemed... 
as clear and as pure as ice and Zoe enjoyed how the mountain breathed dot 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 at her I've added my evidence from this first sentence. The area seemed first bit of evidence as clear and as pure as ice and Zoe enjoyed how, second bit of evidence, the dot 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 at her. That's my evidence done. Now I need to go into my explanation. And when I'm doing my explanation, talking about simile personification, I'm also going to make sure that I mention declarative sentences. I'm going to do that either for my first or second pill paragraph. But I'll also zoom in on one particular word to do my word level analysis. The bulk of your marks are in your explanation, okay? The writer. By the way, you can say the writer, you can say the author, or you can look at the opening insert and refer to them with their surname, okay? So let's have a look here. We've got... Joyce, the author, the writer, whatever, okay? So you can mix it up in that way. In this case, I'm going to say the writer uses, or, um, yeah, so the writer uses a simile coupled with personification, right? So I'm talking about simile and personification, two techniques, killing two birds with one stone. The writer uses a simile coupled with personification, to present the surroundings as being pristine, which means clean, perfect, amazing. Um, now I'm going to zoom in. So I'm not going to mention declarative sentence. I'm going to save that to my second uh, peel paragraph. Now I'm going to... Um, zoom in on one particular word so this is uh, moments that are pure so this is an adjective because it's describing a moment which is an abstract noun okay so the adjective i'm going to focus in on is pure zooming in so i'm still in my explanation the adjective pure zooming in word level analysis illustrates to us as readers Reader effect that being on the mountain has really cleared Zoe's mind. In fact, she is able to think clearly. Here's my explanation this holds a lot of the marks because you are interpreting what the author is trying to say using technique terminology subject terminology this is your ao2 the writer uses a simile language coupled with personification language to present the surroundings as being pristine they are perfect the adjective now i'm zooming in pure illustrates to us as readers that being on the mountain and here i'm talking about reader effect has really cleared Zoe's mind. In fact, she's able to think clearly. As you can see, my pill paragraph is making sure that I'm knocking back all of these different areas that need to go into every um, into each paragraph that you write. But I'm doing so using a very simple format. And that therefore means if I'm using this simple format, I literally am least likely to forget, you know, all of these different steps. Now, I simply need to link it back to the question. Show the examiner. I've not forgotten what I'm supposed to be talking about. I'm supposed to be talking about Zoe's feelings. So here's my link. Thus, we can see Zoe feels at peace. She is incredibly happy and elated to be on the mountain as it gives her peace here's my first full peel paragraph which i would argue is probably racking me up four marks already four marks out of eight i just need to make sure i hit my second point out of the ballpark to secure my full eight marks 
Thus, we can see that Zoe feels at peace. She is incredibly happy and elated. Elated means happy. To be on the mountain as it gives her peace. Okay, so she feels feelings, Zoe's feelings. Now I'm going to move to the final um, pure point, the second um, eight marker, where she says, I'm an eagle, metaphor, okay? And here I'm going to make sure I have to mention the fact that it's a declarative sentence. By the way, guys, I always suggest using declarative sentence for your sentence forms. It's my favorite structure technique. Declarative sentence is literally any sentence. If you're ever stuck on structure, just say declarative sentence. It's a sentence that states a fact, feeling, or mood. Right now, I'm speaking in a series of declarative sentences. Your articles, anything that you read, is written in a series of declarative sentences. They state either a fact, feeling, or mood. So, moving on to my second pill paragraph relating to how she feels, um, you know, very, very um, enlivened. She feels almost that she's rising above nature. She is transcending nature. Really good word, by the way, guys. Yeah. Maybe some of you guys, if you're doing RE, you might have come across this word before. Transcending, rising above the limitations of your body. You're like, oh my gosh, I feel like I can fly. I've got wings. Transcendence. Right? You feel like you're really, really rising above yourself. Okay, guys. I'm using these words. Don't look at these words and say like, oh, I'm not going to use these big words. Okay, fine. Don't use the big words, but also don't think about getting your grade eights and grade nines, okay? You want to show that you also have a mastery of English. It's an English exam, guys, okay? Anyway, so moving on to my second peel paragraph. Furthermore, opening point. Zoe feels so alive that she almost feels like she can fly being on the mountain gives her a feeling of transcendence as she likens, compares herself to a bird. Second point. Furthermore, Zoe feels so alive that she almost feels like she can fly. Mountain gives, gives her a feeling of transcendence so she can rise above her body as she likens herself to a bird. Now I'm going to add my evidence. I am an eagle. She asserts which means she states, I am an eagle. Easy. Evidence done. She asserts, I'm an eagle. Now, this is a metaphor. Mm, this metaphor, uh, or even Grace, or is he called Grace? Let's see what his surname is. Yeah, Joyce. Um, Joyce. uses a metaphor in this declarative sentence. I'm mentioning declarative sentence because I must make sure I talk about sentence forms. Joyce uses a metaphor in this declarative sentence, the language and sentence forms to convey how mm, high and energetic Zoe feels. Okay, so Zoe feels really energetic. Now I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna use I'm gonna focus in on the noun eagle. This is now word level analysis. The noun eagle is especially vivid as we sense that Zoe feels like she is so light and alive on her skis that she can rise above gravity and fly. Here's my explanation, my analysis. Zoe uses a metaphor, language, 
in this declarative sentence, sentence form, to convey how high and energetic Zoe feels. The noun eagle, zooming in, is especially vivid as we sense that Zoe feels like she is so light and alive on her skis that she can rise above gravity and fly. She can transcend her body. She can even transcend gravity. She can rise above gravity. Now I need to think about to the question. Consequently, we as readers can see that Zoe feels um, energetic, um, empowered, um, and energy filled. She, um, almost believes that she can transcend rise above her body and fly link back to the question consequently we as readers can see that zoe feels empowered she feels really strong oh my gosh i can fly an energy field on the mountain she almost believes that she can transcend her body and fly that is my question number two done my two full mark pill paragraphs again guys different teachers have different styles okay so guys as i mentioned mrs sally's um advice is literally point evidence point evidence point evidence i personally think pill paragraphs where you've got point evidence explanation you really add maybe say two points so for example here i've made my two opening points right added my evidence then really dissected the use of language you can combine that into two pill paragraphs okay so that's my suggestion obviously watch the mr sally's um tiktok post that i put up and also as i keep on mentioning guys we're gonna do a collab i'm so excited there's a collab this sunday with mr sally's on youtube okay we're gonna be doing our um prediction videos for Macbeth, all the english literature paper one stuff that's coming up on the 17th anyway guys let's look at question number three this is where you're looking at structure looking at the whole of the source the whole thing okay so you're looking back at the insert and you are told that this text is from the beginning we know this also from this blurb at the top here and you're asked how it's structured to interest you as a reader guys you are always interested as a reader the examiner actually doesn't genuinely care about your opinion if you are bored to tears if you find it really boring doesn't matter you are always interested as a reader remember you must take something from the beginning. When you are quoting from the source, one of your paragraphs must refer to beginning because the bullet point has literally said, focus your attention on beginning. So you have to do that, otherwise you lose marks. My suggestion is combine your observation on beginning with how this focus shifts. I would say, consider what happens at the end. Juxtapose the two. And then think about another structural point. Now, how does it start? versus how does it end i think the way it starts is it's really 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 calm right it's snowing really quiet it's really really beautiful right and actually um so you've got here the uh beginning versus more towards the end not strictly at the end but it's towards the end you've got the um roaring the uh the drama of what's going on right so there's this calm quiet beginning versus towards the end you've got this tumultuous whoop tumultuous ending before there's an obviously complete silence tumultuous means violent it's roaring it's screaming it's scary okay so the beginning you've got the snow it's falling it's calm so it's a very calm beginning versus towards the end it becomes very tumultuous that'll be my first point i would probably juxtapose the um roaring the rumbling that became a roaring the avalanche right versus the beginning this simple sentence at the start however also what's really interesting and this is now actually um something that people tend to miss is it starts off silent right so obviously i'm not going to make the same point it's starting off silent 
However, what I think is interesting is it starts off silent, right? There's this constant reference to silence. But then it also, in the final, final line, right? After all of this violence, this tumultuousness, it also ends with silence, yeah? This ominous silence. There's this shift. The silence at the beginning, which is really, really nice and joyous. The word even just silence shifts in connotations from being really peaceful to being really, really violent. Because it starts silent and in literally the final sentence ends silent, we call this a circular structure. It starts and ends in the same way. Silence, silence. Towards the end, there is this roaring. Yeah, so this is towards the end. However, the actual end, end, it's all silent. Meaning my second point would be to do with the circularity of the extract and i'm literally only going to focus on the one word silence for my second paragraph now getting into the first pill paragraph you're going to notice that my first pill paragraph is a little bit longer than my second pill paragraph because in my first pill paragraph i'm going to juxtapose opening simple sentence with towards the end the rumbling became a roaring two bits of evidence to juxtapose how it starts versus how it ends more towards the end it's not the ending ending because it actually ends with silence but this is as it draws to a close okay so opening pill paragraph firstly using keywords from the question the author successfully interests us as readers because they begin um they use the calm Beginning, using keywords from the first bullet point, they use the beginning to put us at ease. Nevertheless, as the extract draws to a close, the violent, tumultuous, Noise grips us because we wonder if Zoe and Jake die. Okay, I forgot to mention this is an eight marker, two pill paragraphs, same as question two. The only difference is you're not talking about language, you're talking about structure. Therefore, there is no zooming in. You're not doing any word level analysis. Word level analysis is language. Anyway, so this is my first opening point. I'm juxtaposing beginning versus the shift in focus. Firstly, the author successfully interests us as readers. We're always interested because they use the calm beginning to put us at ease. Nevertheless, I'm contrasting. As the extract draws to a close, the violent, tumultuous, violent and tumultuous mean the same thing. The violent, tumultuous noise grips us because we wonder if Zoe and Jake die. Now I'm going to add my evidence from the beginning and towards the end. At first, evidence, it was snowing, yet mm, towards the end there was my hair i'm adding my evidence from the end there was a roaring yet towards the end there was a roaring of the avalanche so here's my evidence two bits of evidence juxtaposed at first it was snowing first line yet towards the end there was a roaring of the avalanche. That's my evidence. Juxtaposing beginning versus towards the end. Not end, end strictly because my ending will be a separate, which is to do with the silence. The writer, actually, I'm going to say Joyce. This is the surname of the author. Joyce um, juxtaposes or contrasts or um, creates a stark contrast um between uh so joyce creates a stark contrast um 
between the um, silent and peaceful, or even I can say the tranquil and peaceful opening as opposed to the noisy ending of the extract. This is especially gripping interest for us as readers because the sudden turn of events unexpected we um we are shocked that these that this paradise has turned into a death trap for Zoe and Jake. Here's my explanation. Juxtaposing beginning and towards the end. Joyce creates, this is the author's surname. Joyce creates a stark contrast between the tranquil, which means quiet and peaceful opening, as opposed to the noisy ending of the extract. Beginning versus shift in focus. Um, this is especially gripping for us as readers. A sudden turn of events is unexpected. We are shocked that this paradise has, um, has turned, not turning, has turned into a death trap for Zoe and Jake. Now I need to link it back to the question. Therefore, the writer maintains or even begins the extract in a captivating way and the dramatic turn of events keeps interested the sudden shift from calmness to violence makes us terrified as we read the passage. Link. Therefore, the writer begins the extract in a captivating way and the dramatic turn of events keeps us interested. You need to talk about any shift in an extract. You talk about the dramatic turn of events. The sudden shift from calmness to violence makes us terrified as we read the passage. That's my first peel paragraph done. I have not zoomed in on any word, okay? So before any of you look at this and you're like, uh, why did you zoom in on question number two, but not in this one? Uh, she's such a fraud. Question number two is language. When you zoom in on one word, you're doing word level analysis. That's not what you're supposed to do in structure, okay? Word level analysis is language. Structure is talking about stuff like beginning versus end, sentence types, and so on, okay? So that's my opening paragraph. However, I need to make sure to get the full eight marks, I add a second pill paragraph talking about other structural features. And as I mentioned, what I'm going to talk about is the shift in connotations of silence. It starts off silent. The silence develops. The silence at first is really nice and positive. It has positive, calming connotations. Yet the same silence shifts in meaning at the end and it becomes ominous. Silence is used as a really powerful structural feature because it creates a circular structure in this extract. It starts off silent, ends off in the final, final, final line silent, okay? This is meant to make the extract captivating for us as readers. Obviously, if you're not a ma massive reader, you might say, oh, that's, that's really boring, but it's, it's supposed to be really interesting, okay? Just, just say it's interesting. So this is the additional point. Furthermore, or additionally, or moreover, moreover, the writer uses the silence 
um, or use a silence as a dramatic device to keep us um, intrigued and interested in the extract. Indeed, the passage begins and ends with um, quietness. I'm trying to use a simile. And this circular structure keeps us entertained. That's my opening point. Moreover, the writer uses silence as a dramatic device to keep us intrigued and interested in the extract. Indeed, the passage begins and ends with quietness and the circular structure keeps us entertained. Now I'm going to literally just talk about the quotation silence. The writers or the writer repeatedly refers to silence. My one word quotation, the writer repeatedly refers to silence. Now I'm going to unpack it. What does this illustrate? The shift in connotations, okay? So now here, this is how you can talk about the shift in meaning of silence from being something that's really nice, calming, beautiful to something that's really ominous, threatening and deadly. Joyce, initially, uses silence to depict a calm and tranquil environment. Silence in the opening of the extract has positive connotations and we can see that this silence gives Zoe much joy. Yet the silence takes on deadly connotations by the end of the extract as Zoe is overpowered by the snow the silence suddenly becomes ominous which means threatening and we are frightened or um about her well-being or her safety here's my analysis of just one word hopefully this also shows that you don't have to write reams and reams of quotations you can take one quote and unpack it and actually sometimes this is a really really powerful way of getting those top band marks grade nine and grade eight okay joyce initially uses silence to depict a calm and tranquil environment silence in the opening of the extract has positive connotations positive meanings and we can see that this silence gives Zoe much joy. Yet this silence takes on deadly connotations by the end of the extract. As Zoe is overpowered by the snow, the silence suddenly becomes ominous and we are frightened about her safety. Now I'm going to link it back to the question. Hence, the writer is this circular structure to keep us captivated as readers. This sudden change in atmosphere 
makes us keen to discover if Zoe and Jake survived. Ending. Hence, linking back to the question, the writer uses this circular structure, structure to keep us captivated as readers, so we're interested. This sudden change in atmosphere makes us keen to discover if Zoe and Jake survived. That's question number three done, okay? Point number one, relating to beginning versus ending. Point number two, this is relating to the use of silence, the connotations, how it shifts in meaning from the beginning to the end. Now I'm going to move on to question number four. This is the final question in section A. This is a student statement. The statement that examiners don't actually really care about, but it doesn't tend to contradict what's going on. Just agree. You can maybe add like a disagreement point. I don't think you need to make it like a massive, like, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, on this hand. No, 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 no. You don't have to. The statement, just to re recap, a student said, so this is line 28 to the end, no earlier than that. So this is from here all the way to the end of the extract, okay? So here all the way to the end. So a student said, this part of the story was Zoe and Jake are caught in the avalanche. I can't believe how Zoe is so slow to react to the warning signs because in the end, the situation sounds really dangerous. I would suggest for this 20 marker, try to make sure you go for four peel paragraphs. You are evaluating. So try to make two of those points language, two of those points structure, okay? So going back to this, line 28 to the end, is Zoe slow to react? I would suggest she is. I would agree. Is she slow to react to the warning signs? Yep, because the situation sounds really dangerous. Yes. Maybe if you want to kind of frame an argument, okay, so this is me kind of reacting a little bit to the Mr. Sally's um, post, right? Because he said, add one line of disagreement. If you did want to just maybe add just one line, right? You could maybe say that perhaps because she's so enamored, she's so in love with the setting. Actually, maybe she's not slow because she's taking everything in. And perhaps maybe, um, you know, she was just so distracted that she didn't realize the danger that she was in. However, I would broadly agree with this, okay? Anyway, so I'm going to find four things, four bits of evidence, a mix of language and structure, talking about why I agree, okay? So guys, I keep mentioning the Mr. Sally's because that's the post, that it, the most recent TikTok post, okay? Anyway, so starting from line 28, I think what's really interesting is this shift from the whisper to a rumble, then a roaring, yeah? So this use of onomatopoeia. The use of onomatopoeia here, where the noises get louder and louder, definitely would support the idea that Zoe is far too slow to react. She has gotten, especially here, whisper and rumble, really early warning signs, okay? So, and also I suppose the use of sibilance here, actually, I'm even just, just focus on whisper and rumble and small slab of snow. She should have been faster to react to the shift in the ground, okay? It's not the first time they've been skiing, so she should kind of have seen the warning signs. That'd be my first point. Also, separately, I think what's really interesting is um, the simple sentence. The rumble became louder, right? And here, this simple sentence, again, supports the idea that Zoe is too slow to react, okay? It becomes noisier, but she's not doing anything. Equally, the fact that she is smiling. Actually, these two simple sentences illustrate that she is absorbing the wrong signs. Okay, so she's too slow. The third thing I would probably focus on is these exclamatory sentences. Exclamatory is um, structure. Jake screaming, shouting at her. It's Jake that discovers the danger they're, they're in. And Zoe is far too slow to react to the warning signs. I'm probably going to use that as maybe like, I'm going to couple the idea that Jake, obviously he's fast enough. Maybe to an extent, I might not agree. But to be honest, I still think I agree, right? Zoe is just way too slow. And it, has, it, it takes Jake's dramatic reaction to snap her out of it, okay? Because the situation is really dangerous. Now, the final thing I would probably talk about in terms of why she's far too slow is she's too slow in um reacting 
and so she gets completely caught up and i'm probably going to take something from towards the end where she's far too slow for somebody who goes skiing and for somebody who's as experienced as she is she's far too slow to um react to this roaring cloud that's like a tsunami at sea this simile and even it sends her twisting spinning turning you've got listing here she's far too slow to react okay so i'm going to use this four bits of evidence starting with the use of sibilance here as well as this whisper and rumble onomatopoeia language i'll also uh, talk about this simple sentence right so um she's getting more and more warning signs but she's so caught up in the moment she doesn't realize what's happening then it's only jake who actually realizes what's happening right he's screaming and shouting at her before finally she acts but she acts too quickly too slowly even because the simile emphasizes that she's too far far too um gone okay so i'm going to write four pill paragraphs making them a mix of language and structure so starting off with my first pill paragraph relating to the opening and i'm gonna because this is going to be my language paragraph i'm also going to do some word level analysis so to begin with first paragraph okay so to begin with instead of always saying firstly i can say i can say to begin with um it is clear that zoe is far too slow to react to the warning signs in fact um the ground beneath her shifted yet she was not attentive to um what was a really dangerous situation so here I have begun my point by using keywords from the student statement and saying, yes, it is clear. So I am indirectly agreeing with the student statement. I'm not going to say I agree. I'm going to try and make it a little bit more sophisticated in third person. OK, to begin with opening point, it's clear that Zoe is far too slow to react to the warning signs. In fact, the ground beneath her shifted, yet she was not attentive to what was a really dangerous situation. OK, so I'm agreeing. Here's my evidence. There was or even the, um, there was a small slab of snow that moved and the noise around her and the whisper around her became a rumble. That's my evidence. There was a small slab of snow that moved and the whisper around her became a rumble. That's my evidence. And I'm going to go into my explanation with uh, my language points, okay? Because this is where I'm evaluating. Um, the writer, the author, uses sibilance coupled with onomatopoeia to convey the um dangerousness or the um, um dangerous or uh, the sudden change in the or on the mountain as the warning signs began to mount Okay, and then now I'm going to zoom in on one particular word. So this, um, perhaps the rumble, the trembling, the verb. Zooming in, rumble is vivid in revealing to us as readers that the mountain was becoming... dangerous 
yet Zoe was too slow to notice it or to notice this sign. So here's my explanation when I zoomed in um, word level analysis. The author uses sibilance, language, coupled with an onomatopoeia, sound word, language two, to convey the sudden change on the mountain as the warning signs began to mount. The verb, zooming in, word level analysis, rumble, is vivid and revealing to us as readers that the mountain was becoming dangerous, yet Zoe was too slow to notice this sign. So now I'm going to link it back to the question. Consequently, it is clear that Zoe was far too slow to react. She had plenty of warning signs. However, she refused to heed these fatal signs. When you heed something, it means you pay attention to that thing. Here's the link. Consequently, it's clear that Zoe was far too slow to react. She had plenty of warning signs. However, she, was, she refused to heed the fatal signs. That's my first pill paragraph. Talked about language. Now I'm going to move on to my second pill paragraph. I'm going to mention a structural technique. The rumble became louder. Okay. So now this is my second pill paragraph. Furthermore, the Zoe receives clues that the and now here i need to make sure i'm paying attention to the warning signs student student statement okay so zoe receives numerous clues that an avalanche is imminent means it's about to start um nonetheless She is still too slow to react. And this puts her life as well as Jake's life in danger. Here's my second point. Furthermore, Zoe receives numerous clues that an avalanche is imminent. It's literally about to start. Nonetheless, she's still too slow to react and this puts her life as well as Jake's life in danger. Adding the evidence. Mm, we learn evidence the rumble became louder yet it made her smile. Here's my evidence taken from here as well as here. These two simple sentences. We learned that the rumble became louder, yet it made her smile. That's the evidence. Um, these structure, simple sentences are um, somewhat infuriating for us as readers. Given that Zoe is clearly experienced in skiing, she should have been more quick to react as the situation was getting more deadly. Here's the explanation evaluating her reaction using structure. These simple sentences are somewhat infuriating for us as readers. Given that has is clearly experienced in skiing, she should have been more quick to react as the situation was getting more deadly. Linking back to the question, as a result, Zoe is certainly too slow to react. Her smile is inappropriate 
as this um, rumble was a clear warning sign. Here's the link back to the question. As a result, Zoe is certainly too slow to react. Her smile is inappropriate as this rumble warning sign second pill paragraph done using structure okay i'm moving between language and structure to ensure that i'm covering both as i'm evaluating and going along now in my third paragraph i'm going to talk about how um jake is the one that is actually very quick to react and maybe so now this is where i'm going to kind of um show you guys especially for those of you that are like oh actually i do want to you know kind of evaluate and maybe say a little bit no okay so again guys this is going back to um the tiktok post where mr sales is basically saying oh um you can also add like to an extent to a tiny tiny little extent why you might disagree okay i can show you how you can do it personally i think you can just simply agree but this is how you can do it where you just add one line of disagreement okay so i'm gonna use this to illustrate how you can do this okay furthermore additionally moreover Mm, additionally we'll go with additionally as the extract progresses it is clear that jake is quicker to react arguably zoe may not have been too slow as she was caught up in the beauty of nature. She was too caught up in the beauty of nature to notice the shift on the mountain. And... It was Jake who noticed these warning signs. Here's my agree with a tiny little disagreement, a little tiny fragment of maybe balancing it off a little bit, but I would say that's it, yeah? Because you just want to agree. It's not a history essay. You're not like making agreement to an extent, disagree, da, da, da. Additionally, as extra progresses, it's clear that Jake is quicker to react. Arguably, Zoe may not have been too slow, arguing, just disagreeing just a tad bit, as she was too caught up in the beauty of nature to notice the shift in the mountain. And it was Jake who noticed these warning signs, okay? So that's my tiny little disagreement, but I'm still broadly saying, yep, I still agree with the student statement. Now, adding my evidence. Jake orders her to evidence get to the side that's my evidence jake orders her to get to the side the writer uses this exclamatory sentence to convey that it was zoe's husband Who noticed the warning signs? Zoe was, or even um, understandably, too distracted by the beauty of nature. Hence, this made her slow to react and jake is the one who noticed this dangerous situation clearly zoe was slow to react to this lethal situation here's my explanation 
The writer uses this exclamatory sentence structure to convey that Zoe's husband who noticed the warning signs. Zoe was understandably too distracted by the beauty of nature. Hence, this made her slow to react and Jake is the one who noticed this dangerous situation. Clearly, Zoe was, Zoe was slow to react to this lethal situation. Now, I need to link it back to the question. Thus, Zoe is, um, was certainly too slow to react to the dangerous scenario that was unfolding. However, we may empathize with her as she was so struck by the beauty of nature. Nonetheless, this still made her ignore all the critical warning signs. Here's a link back to the question. However, or even actually, thus, therefore, Zoe was certainly too slow to react to the dangerous scenario that was unfolding. However, we may empathize with her, so we may see it from her perspective rather than blaming her completely, as she was so struck by the beauty of nature. But, uh, or nonetheless, this still made her ignore all the critical warning signs. So I'm still saying, yeah, okay, maybe we might disagree with the student statement, but I still think broadly, I agree. Zoe is still too slow to react. Even if we can maybe see where she's coming from, she's still too slow. Those are my three pill paragraphs. I still need to add a fourth and final one. I started off with the language, then added two structure observations in my evaluation. Now I'm going to shift back to a final language point to balance out my discussion. I'm going to move to this final simile, this tsunami at sea, still blaming Zoe and still saying, actually, no, she's still way too slow to react. Finally, Zoe is still arguably or is still debatably too slow to react to all the warning signs when her husband warns her about the dangerous avalanche she reacts too slowly meaning she still gets swept up in the snow i still agree this is my final agree point finally zoe is still debatably arguably too slow to react signs when her husband warns her about the dangerous avalanche she reacts too slowly meaning she still got swept up in the snow so i'm going to add my evidence here this tsunami at sea this simile she take oh zoe takes too long to accelerate from the avalanche that is like a tsunami at sea evidence zoe takes too long to accelerate from the avalanche that is like a tsunami at sea okay so i've added accelerate and i've also added this simile the writer or even uses or employs this powerful simile to show how Zoe underestimated 
the danger she was in. She was far too slow. So she was far too slow to um, understand the gravity of the situation as the uh, adjective zooming in tsunami because it's describing the sea as the adjective tsunami emphasizes how lethal this um, situation was. Here's my explanation before I finish off by linking back to the question. Joyce employs this powerful simile language to show she underestimated the danger she was in. She was far too slow to understand the gravity, the importance of the situation as the adjective tsunami, zooming in on one particular word, emphasizes how lethal this situation was. Therefore, hence, um, as a result, in fact, let me see that I've not used as a result before. So, um, oh no, I have used as a result. Thus, consequently, Zoe is certainly far too slow to react to the warning signs. Signs. It is clear that she had plenty of signals that could have alerted her to the danger yet she chose to ignore them here's a link back to the question consequently zoe is certainly far too slow to react to the warning signs it's clear that she had plenty of signals that alerted her to the danger yet she chose to ignore them those are my four peel paragraphs done relating to question number four so as i mentioned student statement doesn't tend to contradict what's going on in the extract i did mention it in paragraph three just a little bit of disagreement just to show you for those of you that are keen on like no i want to also think about how i can add like maybe one line of disagree okay in my third paragraph i did show how you can do that but still without making it into like a massive argument because as i mentioned guys like this statement examiners actually don't care about it also it doesn't tend to contradict what's happening in the extract so my points were a mix of language and structure okay first peel paragraph was to do with language how zoe i agree with the student statement she's too slow second point was a structure point why i agree with zoe's um or the student statement she was too slow third paragraph was largely but disagree it's for those of you that if you saw the post that i put up with mr sales he says oh add one extra line of dis disagreement i don't agree with that i think you can just literally agree and still get really good marks but for those of you that are like oh no hang on hang on hang on barbara i watched that mr sales video you put on tiktok why you know how can we maybe add that so i've shown you how to do that in one paragraph but i think you can just largely agree okay so then fourth and final paragraph agree used a language point so first language to structure then finished off with a final language point so as i mentioned guys today in today's live for those of you who are keen beans you're trying to go for the grade eight grade nine in your final exams we've looked at this paper section a but as i mentioned guys we're going to be looking at creative writing on wednesday okay so wednesday there's going to be a live looking at how to write creative writing for this particular exam paper we're not going to do that tonight okay so i wanted us to look at section a tonight because i have to go however 
on Wednesday, 6 p.m., 6 to 7.15. This Wednesday, we're going to be doing a creative writing for language paper one. Not tomorrow, Wednesday. Tomorrow's Tuesday, obviously. Wednesday is going to be the creative writing question number five. Okay, so I'm going to pop the event. Um, and as I mentioned, guys, super excited because on a Sunday, going to be doing a collab with Mr. Sally's on YouTube, um, doing prediction videos, Macbeth. Inspector Calls, Christmas Carol, Parent Conflict, literally looking at all the past paper questions. Mr. Sallis is going to be giving his uh, predictions. I'm going to be giving my predictions. Okay, this is going to be on YouTube on Sunday. So guys, going to head off next live on TikTok Wednesday at 6 to 7.15, looking at model responses for creative and descriptive writing because a girl's got to go okay so guys i've got to go have another appointment but i hope this was useful we looked at this entire paper guys if you are in year 11 and any of these techniques i've mentioned you don't know what they mean that should be ringing alarm bells okay your first english gcse exam literature paper one is going to be in about two and a half weeks you need to know the meaning of these words if you don't literally just head over to youtube type in english language or i think it's just english literature techniques probably the first top video you're going to see is a video that i did five minutes where i go over here's all the language techniques and what they mean here's all the uh, structure techniques and what they mean if you are not clear on what they mean make sure you watch that five minutes you're going to know the difference between language and structure and what these words mean okay on wednesday as i mentioned guys i will be looking at question number five of this entire paper okay so i'm going to be looking at question five creative writing because as i mentioned guys a girl's gotta go i literally have another appointment i'm just looking at the time and um it just wouldn't have been possible to do all five questions today okay so guys creative writing this wednesday 6 p.m be there or be square i hope this helped guys i'm going to quickly look at the comments in case there's any final questions but then i'm going to wrap this thing up tonight okay it's obviously uh summertime has started guys i'm so excited about summer i don't know about you guys but i'm so excited are you guys going to be going away on holiday anyway no time for holiday yet um exams are just around the corner so push all those thoughts out of your head practice right now is monk mode yeah i don't know if you guys have heard of monk mode this is when you literally work hard like a monk yeah good eating good sleeping practice 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 obviously there's still school so you've got to balance that off today there was no school so hopefully you've made the most of today in terms of revision literally download this paper as well guys practice okay so literally also apply it's not enough watching these lives that's not revision okay this is just i'm giving you guys the tools and techniques to learn this stuff but actually you need to apply and you also need to work on your writing speed your ambitious vocabulary your paragraph structures and so on okay anyway guys Thanks so much for listening. I will be uploading this particular live. Um, guys, as I promised uh, last week, I've stopped playing these um, games. I've, uh, I haven't uploaded um, some of the literature stuff that I did, the lives from last week, right? So I think it's already gone out on YouTube yesterday. So for those of you that missed some of the lives last week, um, it's on YouTube already. I'm going to be uploading this. Um, I think it takes like 24 hours to process on TikTok. So I'm going to try and upload this on TikTok, uh, TikTok, on YouTube tomorrow, if not maybe like, wednesday or thursday or something okay for those of you that join this live late and then obviously you can watch this as part of your revision for language paper one thanks guys so much for joining in um and i shall end the live let's have a look um so guys lit paper one live stream oh actually guys i could do a lit paper one um live stream as i mentioned i'm also going to be doing um the uh prediction videos with mr sally's on sunday so uh that for the lit stuff um and so i'm thinking mm, i don't know actually the live stream may be on thursday okay so i'll see you guys um question five 6 p.m wednesday gonna put up the um the what's it um gonna put up the event on um tiktok okay so after this um guys mocks tomorrow um oh guys Tomorrow mocks, um, quick tips, watch the um, post that I've just put up just now. This is for paper one, by the way, guys. If anyone's doing mocks, paper one for language, literally look at that. Um, I put up with Mr. Salazar's, um advice in three minutes. There's some really, really good tips. His top tip actually was like working backwards. Start with question five and four, because if you do question five and four, you've got 75% of the marks, which I think is good. But also I think it's... Um, uh, it can be a bit intense to start with question five. My suggestion is just be super strict with timings, okay? And obviously know what to 
question. Question number one, four statements, four marker. Question number two, language, two pill paragraphs, language each. Question number three, structure, two pill paragraphs. Question number four, language and structure. You are agreeing with the student statement. And question number five is creative writing. Go for creative writing, okay? Um, guys, question five, uh, paper two is going to be next week. So paper two, uh, it's only going to be paper one this week and um, a lit paper. So literature, maybe on Thursday, I think, okay? Guys, um, the Mr. Sallies and... Um, first year tutors uh on sunday on youtube is going to be at four four o'clock okay so um i am going to be releasing like a few more mr sally's um tip videos and stuff on tiktok as well but that's going to be um oh q5 paper two um that's going to be i think we did some predictions um for paper that's actually quite a good question that's a very good question question five paper two um mm. I'm going to think about that, guys. Okay, so question five, paper two. This is language paper two. Because um, the predictions we're going to do on Sunday are going to be for literature. Macbeth, Christmas Carol, um, Power and Conflict, Inspector Calls. But actually, that's a really, really good question for paper uh, paper two. Language paper two, question five. That's actually really good. I'm going to actually create like a prediction video for that. Um, keep linking. No, guys, it's not too... Rep guys, 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 when I keep on saying for these questions, using keywords from the question... Okay? You are showing the examiner you get what the question is asking of you. It's not too repetitive. It's actually you are showing you understand the assignment. Please do not forget that you need to use keywords from the question. Yeah, it's not too repetitive. In fact, if anything, guys, remember these examiners are human beings. Yeah, they are reading like 40 to 50 scripts a day. If you don't like say stuff in really crystal clear black and white language and you try and be like a little bit sly or whatever, like, oh, I want to like not be too repetitive. They can, you can lose marks because of that. Okay. So like really, really, you know, try to reinforce that. Obviously you're not putting it every single sentence, but in your opening point and your link back to the question, do refer back to the keywords in the question. That's really important guys. Um, predictions for unseen poetry. That's going to be the, um, collab vid. Okay, so this is the collab video. Unseen poetry. Yeah, actually, guys. Oh, actually, that's a good suggestion. Maybe I'm going to do unseen poetry on Thursday. Wednesday is 100% creative writing. And I actually managed to get my hands on the 2022 paper. So I think I might do that for the unseen poetry. Um, love and relationships. Oh, um, I think I might be doing love and relationships with Mr. Sally's on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I might ask him. Um, so we're going to be fil filming later on today. Or no, no, not today. This week um i'll ask him if we can do the um love and relationships but yeah guys i'm super excited about this collab oh my gosh it's my first youtube collab i am literally fangirling okay like i literally mrs sally's is a teacher that i super respect and i'm so excited to be having this collab anyway guys um paper one questions yeah this is paper one q1 to four but we're gonna do q5 on um wednesday wednesday 6 p.m guys 6 to 7 15 i'm literally cutting off at 7 15 yeah so um don't say you're gonna fail please guys stop saying you're gonna fail like don't yourself okay mindset guys mindset okay don't say that anyway guys um this live is gonna be uploaded um oh you watch which, which video did you watch M mo the baller <laughs> nice nice name mo the baller um what mark grade nine or 68 grade nine is like from 68 70 band yeah um mm picture of the statement question question five um i think on wednesday i'm gonna see it's a toss-up between creative to be honest guys i personally prefer going for creative writing yeah usually actually all my students so this is my personal students that are tutor i always suggest guys just go for creative writing so i might go for creative writing um so i'll probably go for the statement question this is creative writing it just gives you a bit more um space um so guys gonna head off um guys creative writing live is wednesday be there or be square guys for those of you that need last minute tips for language paper one watch the most recent video on tiktok mr sales goes in three i say mr sales he's mr sally's right anyway he um in three minutes he literally tells you everything you need to know for paper one so just watch that video as well yeah if you've got like mocks or something tomorrow or like some mocks related to paper one tomorrow or something like that okay um guys Thanks so much for, yeah, yeah, guys, uh, language, when the exams, so English language, paper one and paper two, I am going to be mixing that in um, throughout. English lit is going to be, I'm thinking I'm gonna, probably going to do a live this Thursday for Unseen Poetry. Um, but Wednesday will be language. I'm going to be mixing up language and literature going forward, guys, okay? And by the way, remember, guys, as I keep on mentioning, I try and make sure I do lives each Monday. Um, I keep on saying this and then breaking my promise, guys, but I'm going to try not to break my promise 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 also next monday um bank holiday gonna do a bank holiday live okay i'm probably gonna make that one um a language paper two live okay um macbeth 
Ooh, I might do a Macbeth live, guys. I'm not sure, but um, I think I might. Not Jekyll and Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde, I've done so much stuff on um, t uh, on YouTube. So if you want to see like some Jekyll and Hyde stuff, like also head over to YouTube, okay? Guys, see YouTube as like a resource, especially because, as I mentioned, I have been so booked and busy this term. Like last year, this time last year, I was doing these lives all the time and I've just become super busy this year so um look to youtube guys for um as also like an additional resource especially for um because i have less time to allocate to like doing these lives on tiktok inspector calls that one is going to be next week so, inspector calls doing a prediction video with mr sally's as well okay um macbeth okay so i'll definitely do macbeth inspector calls okay um not sure about edXL boys don't cry i'm so sorry oh i'm new to your videos i'm in 11 um mow the baller head over to first rate shooters youtube just to check out the videos and as i mentioned there is a mr sally's have i said mr sally's enough guys like how many times has somebody been doing a count like i'm literally that excited guys like he is i literally respect him so much as a teacher christmas carol already did um a christmas carol live i did the christmas carol live last week yeah so i'm so sorry guys for those of you that want to do christmas carol i literally had announced it even on youtube and i said this is the last live i'm doing on tiktok for christmas carol i have posted that final live on youtube i believe i did it uh, i posted it and put it up on um sunday there's no more christmas carol so guys also when i say i'm doing like one live for the last time it's literally done yeah i might do um macbeth one last time and then it's done same for inspector carol uh, uh, inspector calls yeah um so guys thank you for joining in um i have to go guys i have to go king leah i love that play by the way guys my favorite shakespeare play before i leave is um hamlet because it's basically like lion king but actually you know lion king if anyone loves lion king it's basically the borrowed um hamlet anyway lion king and king leah king leah is like a close second i really like that play but i'm not i'm not going to do a model answer for that sorry anyway guys uh this is going to be on youtube probably uh because uh, it has to buffer on tiktok like tiktok needs to like process this it usually takes 24 hours um probably towards the end of the week okay so guys um thank you so much for joining in i keep on saying i need to go i actually do need to go yeah thank you need to go need to go thank you guys for the love and um wednesday 6 to 7 15 looking at creative writing for this paper so download this paper and um you know you can follow the live on wednesday thanks guys Love you all. Gonna head out. Bye-bye.